Hello, and welcome back to Introduction to Computational Fluid Dynamics. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today we'll have another very short class on another special topic on aeroelasticity. This class will be more so focused on what aeroelasticity is. It's unfortunately true that most universities and aerospace departments do not offer an elective or technical elective to grad students or undergrads on aeroelasticity. It is one of the most traditional subjects and beautiful mathematical subjects in aeronautics. Nonetheless, today, aeroelasticity remains, and almost all flight vehicles, and even contemporary flight vehicles today, suffer aeroelastic effects. It is our effort to eliminate them so that we do not have a flight vehicle failure, or worse, damage the flight vehicle in flight. In this particular class, we will look at an introductory on aeroelasticity on a famous NASA paper, which is free and open to the public, and is free of copyright restrictions in the United States of America. It is written by Kalani and Bartels. You can find this paper through a search on the NASA Technical Reports server if you want to read in more detail. I've also shown additional figures and insight from my own work. We'll try and cover just the basics, but I encourage you also to pause the video and read through the slides and look up things on your own too. I'm just showing you the overview and basics. Let's keep this fun and concise. We'll talk about today about the introduction, of course, of aeroelasticity and look at particular aeroelasticity effects in our everyday lives and through the aerospace industry. We'll then talk about some basic models of aeroelasticity and as we do that, we'll note how they're integrated into contemporary CFD codes. Today, this is almost seamless for commercial codes and many even research solvers, I'll note, have aeroelasticity effects built in. It comes down to having a simpler dynamic model for the vehicle, which deforms the computational grid due to the forces and feedback from, of course, the vehicle itself to the fluid dynamics. This couples the simulation between a structural dynamic solver and the CFD solver itself. Now, one of the most famous examples and beautiful things is the fluid structure interaction of, say, a flag. Here we have a particular American flag, and you can see the waves in the flag. This is a great example of where we have a particular structure which is porous and moving and could be modeled by a dynamical system. It is linked and coupled with, of course, the turbulent wake, which is created by the atmosphere, of course, and the turbulence by the pole as it goes down the flag. This is truly an aeroelastic problem of the greatest complexity. It might also be seen in parachutes. A parachute is a very similar structure to a flag. It is, that is, it contains the same physics and fluctuations, but additional forces because of the lines of the parachute. So aeroelasticity is truly by definition, the combination of a fluid dynamics problem and the dynamics of an aerospace body. In this case, the body might deform and vibrate and fluctuate so much that it breaks apart. This is a very unfortunate thing. There's all kinds of different types of aeroelastic phenomena too. These can, for example, be called the limit cycle oscillation, the transonic flutter, buffeting or buffet, and buzz. These are all current challenges and things that must be accounted for when designing all aerospace vehicles that fly through the atmosphere or any other atmosphere. Generally, these are nonlinear phenomena that are caused by linear instabilities combined with nonlinears of the fluid dynamic motions and structure, or perhaps a combination of the both. You can see one particular video made by the NACA, which is, of course, kindly posted by somebody on YouTube. You can try and type this in or search on YouTube or another video site, or even better, find the original videos on NASA.gov. Let's look at some historic aeroelasticity problems through the vehicle failures. Particular aircraft have experienced tremendous aeroelastic phenomena or failures, and there's some list of these on the left. The Hanley Page or 400 showed an elevator fuselage aeroelastic failure. The Junkers Ju-90 fluttered during a flight flutter test, which is very bad. The P-80, F-100, and F-14 Tomcat suffered transonic airline buzz. A T-46A suffered a servo tab flutter. An F-16 and F-18 suffered um, external stores, LCO, and buffeting. And the F-111 and F-117 had tremendous flutter. The F-117 vertical fin flutter is shown on the right. Here it is at a particular air show where someone was handy with their camera and captured the flutter phenomena 
which of course broke it apart. It's a very violent, fast, and abrupt instability of the aircraft coupled with the flow, which led of course to the flight vehicle uh, failing. The upper right is a CFD simulation of a bridge, and the bridges you might see in certain beautiful videos, like the like the Takama Narrows Bridge, fluttered and led to a failure of a famous suspension bridge. You can see these videos online, and that is used as a, often a test case of an engineering ethics class. These are just fun examples, maybe not for the pilots. Now there's many types of aeroelastic phenomena, as I mentioned. There are static ones and dynamic ones. Static meaning they're truly non-moving, but can lead to uh, non-oscillatory behavior, the failure. So lift might be um, removed from the vehicle due to the aeroelastic effects, kind of divergence, control surface effectiveness and reversal, airline effectiveness and reversal. That's uh, lift reversal essentially. Dynamic aeroelasticity, uh, which is probably most popular for people to study, is flutter and gust responses, like a vehicle might go into flutter and oscillate very violently, like you've seen in the tail of this vehicle, and break apart. A gust in the air could lead to a dynamic aeroelastic response, a buffet. The very worrisome limit cycle oscillation, which occurs in many vehicles. Panel flutter, that is a particular panel on the vehicle, might start to vibrate or flutter. Transient maneuvers might lead to these types of problems. And control surface buzzes, which is another type of air elastic phenomenon might occur. These are all problems and things that are studied in air elastic theory. And air elasticians today are hard to come by. And they are very good and in depth in what they do. So you might consider this field for yourself if you're a student. In transonics, there's even more difficult behaviors like flow nonlinearities for accurately predicting study air elastic behavior in the transonic regime. So there's its own area of air elastic studies in the transonic regime. So a lot of early supersonic vehicles experience very difficult transonic behaviors like the Bell X1. In fact, it would not be good to fly vehicles like the Bell X1 and the transonic speeds due to air elastic effects and failures. Now, the interaction between the shocks and the control surfaces can also lead to air elasticity, and all these air elastic effects might reduce the effectiveness of control features and effectiveness. So you can see how important air elasticity is in our field. Now, air elasticity can be classified. The types of air elastic effects can be classified in two categories. One is static and one is dynamic. In the static ones, we might have divergence where the wing just deforms and breaks off, or we might have control reversal where the effect of the controls are reversed. Or we might have dynamic effects which often involve like periodic oscillations that grow and to infinity and of course then something will break on the aircraft which is very bad. They might be flutter and you might see flutter, look at a stop sign or a sign when you're driving along the road, look at a sign and it might be vibrating back and forth like a twisting motion and it, that's an actually a flutter phenomena. The sign itself might be looked at as like a wing and the airflow of the sign is being induced and coupled its dynamics with the fluid dynamics to, to move back and forth rapidly and that forcing motion will eventually cause it to break off and fly away. You can see these in videos of say hurricanes too hitting land masses where there's signs or billboards. Buffeting is a case where you have a buffeting of the flow hitting in a periodic motion that's in coupled with the, like the inherent vibrations of the flight vehicle, which would force it to larger and larger oscillations and break apart. And there's a whole class of transonic um, aeroelastic dynamic problems too, which occur uniquely in the transonic flow stream. This, of course, effect was responsible for many flight vehicle failures, which were originally trying to break the sound barrier back, of course, in the 1950s. Let's look more at the three most important air elastic phenomena. There's flutter, which is a periodic motion of an aerodynamic body to the flow. So that's where they're sort of in a periodic motion. There's a gust response where there's a large gust of air or turbulent vortex or large eddy which hits the vehicle and causes an impulse which causes it to go into an air elastic failure. And there's buffeting, which is in response to the aerodynamic body to a periodic fluid motion. So flutter is where the fluid is causing the device to go into periodic motion. A buffet is where the fluid is coming in in a periodic behavior to force a motion on the vehicle. So it's a slightly different phenomena and reason it's happening. So that's a little subtle, so watch out for that. 
Now you might say, well, we need now beyond the Navier-Stokes equations to model the dynamics of the vehicle. Traditionally, the most interesting problem that people studied to examine flutter in particular was the simple mass spring damper system. This is a first order differential equation. Here, delta double dot is the um, position of this little airfoil in the right figure. And the delta, of course, is the distance from its undisturbed position to the floor. K is like a spring force, and D is a damping force, and M is a mass, the mass of the system. And so this second order ordinary differential equation has certain analytical solutions for certain coefficients, and it is well studied both in mathematics and aerospace. So it's an excellent candidate. So we can model this mass spring damper airfoil to try and encompass and predict aeroelasticity effects. This was the approach that was traditionally used and combined with CFD, but also used before CFD was invented to predict the onset of aeroelasticity effects on modern and contemporary and historic aircraft. Therefore, you can see it's very important. Here, F might be seen as an aerodynamic loading. And so the aerodynamic loading might be found from a coupled CFD solver with the structural dynamics model. The actual model of structural dynamics today, of course, are for the whole aircraft. And modeling the whole aircraft is this type of linked dynamical system of equations with equivalent masses, dampening, and spring coefficients, with forcing found from the CFD, of course, and the natural tendency of the body to return to its undeformed state through a spring coefficients. So you can see we can basically take a CFD solver and link in with a dynamical system of the structure with moving grids to completely model the elasticity today. This is often what's done in practice. Nonetheless, let us look at these classic cases to understand the physics. Now these structures are typically modeled with say spring coefficients, dampening, and masses. Although these are not necessarily represented by these finite element approaches in either particular coordinates. These equations are seen and solved in the Lagrangian framework, but the fluid dynamic equations are of course solved in the Eulerian framework. This is why these types of solvers are typically called Eulerian Lagrangian solvers. The external loads are strictly usually done and found through, of course, the CFD, or simpler sets of equations. These types of dynamical systems can actually be modeled. The original numerical models might take a typical aircraft and just make it into some bars with particular degrees of freedom. If you actually want to model the fuselage and panels and the wings and fuselage, you might have something more like on the right. So this is like a simplified model of the Bell X1 type system on the left and the right. So by increasing the fidelity, of course, we can increase the fidelity of our predictions. But of course, we pay a higher computational cost. Now we might say we want to try and model the structural and flow field nonlinearities. If we want to do that, we would have to incorporate nonlinear terms into our structural dynamics equations. This is not really a problem for modern computers, but unfortunately, we would find our ways moving away from the classic linear ODEs to model the dynamics of aircraft for air elasticity. Today, the integration of the air elasticity and dynamic solvers with the CFD solver is becoming more and more complicated. For example, we have to keep on a temporal basis track of both the structure, the computational meshes between the Lagrangian solvers and the CFD solver and their interfaces for boundary conditions. On the right, we show one particular flow chart from the famous fun 3D type solver on how the linking is done between mesh adaptation and regeneration, the motions of the grid, the Grangian solver, and the CFD solver. Take a few minutes to look at the figures on the right. Let's look at one particular example again. I mentioned the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. A 42 mile per hour wind induced a vertical separated flow that led to torsional flutter. You can see the bridge in its original form, and people actually used to cross the bridge when it was bending back and forth. So if you take your hand and move it along its axis, you can imagine how the bridge bends. And there's many videos posted online. So if you search in Google for the video of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, or go to this link if it still exists on YouTube, someone posted the video of of course, people actually crossing the bridge when it's fluttering and um, its eventual failure during a high wind day at 42 miles per hour. This is actually a classic study in engineering ethics, and we won't go into that in this class. We'll just look at it from a simple 
viewpoint that bridges and buildings and structures also go under elasticity effects. And of course, there's contemporary CFD simulations to look at this particular failure. Today, bridges are designed differently with both aerodynamic considerations and dynamical system considerations for their structure and masses as they move to minimize their chances of uh, basically breaking due to aerodynamic forces. Now, there's a famous DARPA program, the X-29 program, which was tailored and examined to look at instability and stability of aircraft. So here's the Grumman X-29, the tech demonstrator number one, and you might see this particular flight vehicle in particular museums. And it was looked at to look at a particular graphite epoxy forward swept wing. And so this is inherently a little bit of an unstable situation for the aircraft. And of course, it had to use a fly-by-wire system to control the aircraft. That is, it's very unlikely without a computer system for controls that the aircraft would remain stable in the air. And therefore, of course, a computer system had to come in and make corrections for the pilot to keep it stable. Nonetheless, there's also videos of this beautiful aircraft if you look for X-29 and you can see it fly and you can think about the elastic effects. This vehicle also had design elements from the simple systems like I showed on slide 10 where they coupled CFD with simple bar elements to make these lattice paddle elements and to do instability calculations and simulations using CFD. We might look at one particular dynamics of the so-called Kalene fighter wing example, which is just a, just a basic, this isn't a real wing, but it's just one to illustrate the problem. So here's the basic computational domain for the structural solver. And they use a small disturbance equation aerodynamic model, which we discussed in the first part of this class in the fluid dynamic equations. Review that now if you don't recall the small disturbance equations. Those small disturbances at high speed and, and no separation cause all kinds of modal shapes and frequencies to form, which can lead to aeroelastic effects and, of course, flight vehicle failure. Here, they've superimposed the undeformed wing as the black lines in connectivity with nodes with the deformed wing in green. So mode one, they can calculate its frequency at 5.62 hertz for a particular flow speed. And of course, the wing will just flap up and down. The next mode is like a torsional or bending mode in mode three. Mode two will have a single deformation in the spanwise direction. And mode four will have a deformation, which of course is more complicated. So these modes of the wing, of their deformations, can be calculated with a simple combination of a finite element structural solver using the dynamical systems of motion, which we showed earlier, with a very, very simple CFD solver using the small disturbance equations. What a beautiful simulation. And this is one of the classic examples that was coming out of the 1980s and early 1990s to study air elasticity. Today, of course, these simulations are much more complicated, but if this simple case could not be performed, it would be impossible to solve the more complicated cases. Let's continue looking at the results of this particular case. In this particular case, we have flutter velocity versus flutter frequency. Now, as the Mach number increases, flutter would be induced. That is the rapid oscillating motion of the particular wing. And on the y-axis, on the right, we have the flutter frequency versus Mach number. And on the left, we have the fighter wing incoming velocity versus, versus Mach number. So let's look at the right particular figure. Up through, say, Mach 0.9, we have a very low particular frequency and no problem. But at a particular transonic value and supersonic speeds, we have a humongous jump and we are inducing flutter. We can also look at the particular values of pressure coefficient of the rigid versus inelastic wing. So this is a case where we're looking at the wing deformation through its particular frequencies of flutter. On the left, we show the static deformation. So this is like the basically the deformation of the wing with just static loading calculated from the CFD. The CFD aerodynamic loading is balanced by the deformation loading of the wing. This occurs in all flight vehicles in the stable flight regime. So you can see out near the tip of the wing, there's much deformation. You can see this on your next commercial flight. If you sit in the window by the wing and look out at the wing, you can watch the wing upon takeoff. You'll notice that the wing tip goes much farther up in the air. It's rising in the air as a function from the root where you're sitting near the base of the wing to its span. So you can see the static aeroelastic deformation effect on your everyday flights. 
What you hopefully will not see is quick and successive vibrations in the particular modes of the colonnade fighter wing into higher and higher frequencies as you approach higher speeds. These vibrations of the wing lead to, of course, lower lifespans of the wing because it's vibrating at high speeds and that's bad for any structural device. It can also lead to if the vibrations are high enough frequency and large enough amplitude that they will oscillate into higher and higher motions into a feedback loop which would diverge and cause the wing to break apart. This has of course happened on older commercial aircraft and a great deal of care, as I'll show an example, goes into studying the static deformation of the wing, so the wing doesn't just break off due to a high static deformation, or into a limit cycle op oscillation where of course the wing breaks apart doing the flutter. We can also look at the nonlinear effects of the famous Colonial Fighter Wing example. Here's the nonlinear versus linear analysis at Mach 0 0.93, angle of attack 0 0.5, and of course a 20% increase into the buffeting of the incoming flow. So this is like a buffeting study. There's a Goster buffet that's 20% higher than the incoming flow velocity. Here we show contours of basically the structural elements within the wing that hold it together, of course, at different members. That's a finite element type analysis of structural dynamics due to this aerodynamic loading and buffeting. So here you can see a percent change with these basic colors on, of course, the strain of the wing between the nonlinear and linear analysis. So you see in this case, this study is illustrating that you cannot necessarily just use a linear stability or structural deformation analysis. You'll have to include nonlinear effects for realistic cases at Mach 0.93 and say 20% um, gust velocity. These types of works have also been applied to other types of missions like the NASA high altitude high aspect ratio type of vehicle. This vehicle can be seen in the Smithsonian in DC out at the this vehicle can be seen in the Smithsonian in the DC area by the airport. It basically has a large solar panel on the top of the wing and it uses many small propellers that are electrically driven to drive the aircraft. This is a case where elasticity effects due to gusting can lead to total flight vehicle failure. And an aeroelasticity group worked on this type of design for a long time to find a stable configuration. In commercial aviation, almost all new flight vehicles to be certified have to go under an aeroelasticity wing test. This is for the static deformation and failure. Here's the actual test from a publicly available photo from Boeing. This is the Boeing 787 Dreamliner static test. So there's the fuselage, and all this blue structure around it is to, to support a uniform loading and bending of the wing. The wing is brought up to very high positions, way beyond where it would normally fail. And of course, it doesn't fail, but at some limit it will. And they have one particular wing where they do these tests on, and they keep bending it further and further until it fails. They release the wing back to its undeformed state without any loading and study the damage on all the structure of the wing. Eventually they raise this wing to a very high position where it fails. You can watch videos of this particular failure through a carefully controlled study to reduce of course and understand the static failure of wings by watching these particular videos at this YouTube link or you can just google Boeing 787 wing deformation and failure. In this class, we just touched on the very base of one of the most traditional and beautiful subjects of aerospace engineering, that is aeroelasticity. It has a wonderful historic history, which is just as deep as the history of fluid dynamics or acoustics or any other field, with many major players. And aeroelasticity is a subject which was pioneered and really pushed forward through NASA and the NACA in the United States and all their other sub-organizations. It is critical and often air elastic failure happens in vehicles very quickly and very violently. It's a very important subject. Today there's very few air elasticity groups in themselves and that they've been integrated into other groups that are experimental or perhaps of CFD. Almost all commercial solvers today have some sort of air elasticity or structural dynamics module put in them. They basically come down when it comes to CFD as an integration of the CFD solver with the structural equations of motion, simpler dynamical systems, which are usually linear in nature. These are rather good predictors, but there's nothing more important than having an expert aerolistician on your flight vehicle design team. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.